So we'll talk about Foundry, not the big brain vision stuff, like simple, like how to use it, 101. Um, so Foundry 101. I am this guy on Twitter. Like I was supposed to write something about me, it was like, yeah, it's over there. So I work in Nomad uh, with the bridges. Actually, we do an optimistic bridge. Um, I have been a contributing Foundry since, since it was called Turbo Dub Tools. Uh, yeah, and we're going to talk about Forge, which is the main testing apparatus of Foundry. Uh, we'll do a, piece, a little bit of cast. I think it's very useful as a CLI tool to easily be able to uh, interact with the chain. And then Q&A, uh, I try to prepare much less than the time, so we have time to discuss. Um, you know, well, I'm not going to walk you through the docs, read the docs. Uh, we'll talk about some mental models, so you can get up to speed super quick. And of course, we'll try to, to cover as much as possible, uh, although I'm not sure. Um, yeah, so let's start with the very basics. Let's find our terminal, and let's install Foundry, right? So we should go over here. Da -da -da. Foundry is installed. Ta-ta, so I can do this, it works. So that's one of the first things that you'll find in Foundry. It's super fast, it's super easy to deploy, it's super easy to install. Basically, we took everything we hate about the existing tooling, and we kind of fixed it. So um, we installed it. Let's continue. Um, how is a directory set up? That's a tricky one if you're coming from hard hat, if you used DAPTOS before, it's the same, basically, Foundry builds on the mental models that were established with DAP tools. So the usual uh, setup has a TOML file, which is your configuration file. Then it has a lib file where your libraries, uh, not your libraries, but let's say the smart contracts you use already, it's not libraries in the smart contract lingo. Uh, for example, DS test, and then your source code, uh, your contracts, and Sorry? Oh shit, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. So, and then you, for every contract you want to test, you just create a new Solidity contract called uh, .t.sol. So, uh, if we talked about the vision stuff, you would already know that a core principle of Foundry is that you can test in Solidity. And why we want that? Because we don't have context switching. Like, it's impossible to write it you know, language on, uh, on one thing, and then you have to test in another. Uh, like when I started doing smart contracts, I wasn't, I don't speak JavaScript, sorry guys. Like, I don't, I'm a bus guy. So, like when I had to set up hard hat, I had to learn like, language, you know, JavaScript, and the new mental models, the event loop, whatever, I was like, nope, like, nope. And I did that tools, <laughs> and in 30 minutes I was testing. And that's important, because when you test easily, you test a lot, and when you test a lot, you produce more secure code. So that's about you know, Foundry. Like all these things we're talking about, it's about producing more secure code. Because if testing is hard, you're just going to deploy. You're a digen, you know that. Uh, so now we can you know, create a template, you can use a template. So Foundry in it, this template it will just create a directory, set up your template, install your libraries, and boom, we're ready. Uh, let's go and see how the tests are. Uh, let's see, okay. So let's suppose we have this uh, very small smart contracts. We, you know, imp we do our imports, we have our tests here, we have our code here. So this is the smart contract we're going to deploy in production, right? Again, oh my God. This is a, a workshop for ants. Good? I, I, I can't see it. <laughs> Give me feedback. Better? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So, so we have our smart contract. It's super simple. Um, and then we're going to write a test for it. So basically, our test is a smart contract where we have the function setup, and a function for every test. So, if you come from hardhat, this is basically before each or before. So, what 
uh, Forge does, will you know, go to this kind of type of contract with T, will find all functions that start with test, and will run these functions. And before every function, it will run the function setup. So this, so we can logically organize our uh, our test in a smart in a contract. Then we run a setup before each test to set up, you know, variables, uh, whatever, and then we run the te the unit test. Um, yeah. So let's see a good pattern and a bad pattern. So. With this, basically, with setup, you create fixtures. And with smart contracts, the idea is that you inherit from one contract to another, so you can create more legible code. So let's see a good code. For example, this is, was created by Georgios, uh, that's a port of testing for uh, Uniswap. And you see, basically, he creates a contract here that sets up some fixtures. Uh, fixtures are some uh, baseline things we need to test. And then he inherits that contract, right? Uh, he calls the, set, the setup code, which is this, and then does some other stuff. So why would we want to do this? Uh, basically because we either do this, or we do this monstrosity, which is like a huge thing that it's unmaintainable. Like all this is a setup function. Okay, this is a monstrosity I wrote a few months ago. <laughs> um, it's the same thing, like the end result is that you get your testing environment ready and you can test. But the difference is here that you have a much modular approach. So that's the first mental model you have to think about. Like, think about your, what you need to set up and try to divide that into logical fixtures. And then every fixture is a contract. And then you can inherit that and you can call all setup functions uh, recursively. So in the end, you have your, uh, your stuff. That's a very good um, mental model that I didn't have at the time. Um, yeah, so uh, another good stuff we tried with Foundry is to have better understanding of our gas. So uh, gas use, you have to actually do have two commands for that. Uh, it's called force test. Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So now I run the tests. Uh, it doesn't matter. We'll see uh, the results. It, it, it will take a, long, a, a little time because we're fuzzing. Uh, basically, we have two type of gas reports. One that shows how much the testing should things you, your every function consumes, which is gas report. And then gas snapshot is a great tool because it produces a very small text file with all the gas that was consumed for every unit test. So for every unit test, here we get a report that says that this function uh, consumed that amount of the gas. And this is great because we can uh, add this to the uh, or git. So whenever we, we do stuff, we can easily find through git diff if the gas changed when we, you know, we refactored some code or whatever, so then we can see that maybe we did something bad. Uh, this is the gas report. Um, this doesn't show how much your your tests actually consume, but this shows how much the foundry thinks your functions consume. Uh, and this is like a, again a very good bird eye on how to your gas consumption. Um, yeah. So um, when using Foundry, you have to basically use, if you use two li libraries, you're set. We have Forge standard, uh, the standard lib, which basically has a lot of helper functions. And uh, basically, all you have to do is to inherit uh, in your base test from test. And then you get access to all the things that we're going to talk about. Um, and another is Soulmate. Um, it's very deeply ingrained into Foundry, and Soulmate is uh, an alternative to Open Zeppelin, basically, a more opinionated, more uh, gas optimized. Um, yeah. So another great uh, thing about Forge is that it enables mainnet forking. So we can take the state from mainnet or some RPC endpoint, and we can run test against that. So let's see how we do this. So here, 
Uh, in the setup function, we say that we want to create an interface for this address, right? This is an address which is already deployed. We want to test something. So first thing, uh, we go here, and we can do cast interface. And we get complete interface for all the things. So we can just copy paste what we want. We have already done that here. You see, we have created already an interface. And I want to write, write, uh, run some tests. So we ran them like five minutes ago. And the first thing you'll see is that here. Uh, yeah. So the first thing you'll see is that we have a very good call trace story. It's very uh, detailed. You see all the, the gas that was consumed. So, oh my god. <laughs> you see all the gas that was consumed for, for every call. You see which calls succeeded, the, the green ones. And you see uh, which calls were, didn't succeed, the red ones. We see that a call didn't succeed here, a test. Hmm, let's see what's happened. We see that the get message, uh, it reverts. So this is the get message, right? It's, it's simple, it takes an old, a batch 32, it's another batch 32, and supposedly it should uh, you know, create a byte array of that. But for some reason, it doesn't. A great tool to understand what's happening uh, in, our, you know, in our code is to run forge test, but with debug. So for some reason, I, I, I can't see it for some reason, uh, it doesn't work as expected. So these M stores are obviously wrong, but I'm not sure why. Uh, so we can go to, oh yeah, that doesn't work. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this is the debugger, which actually it's an amazing piece of technology by Brock Elmore. Um, it's greater if you see it on my screen. Um, and basically, I've used Remix debugger. You can go through all the opcodes of your contract, and you can easily see how they affect memory and, st and the stack. So if we go down and we go directly to the uh, smart contract we are testing, and we go to the uh, here, yeah. So when the source code is highlighted, it means that it runs. So we are going to fast forward, and we're going to go to the exact part that we think something is wrong. So here it creates a new bytes array, sure, that's OK. Uh, and now it enters, it should enter the assembly code. Yeah. So we see here that it loads uh, the number domain. If you see, I'm not sure if it's visible, uh, it's tightly packed at the top of the smart contract. Um, if I zoom in, it might, does it work? Yeah. Can you see better now? Yeah, so it's tightly packed at the top of the smart contract, and the S load loads the entire world, 32 bytes. But it's only four bytes. So if we see here, uh, yeah, it doesn't work, sorry. I have to, yeah, you have to trust me. So <laughs> uh, here we see that actually it loads both words, uh, both numbers that are tightly packed in the same EVM word, but then, they get uh, deleted in the next M store. Hmm. So that's why it's, it's, the, the test is failing, because actually we haven't shifted uh, the number. So it gets overwritten, because we need to, uh, in the array, we have to add every piece of uh, data one after another. So the debugger shows us a great in great detail how our code interacts at very at the EVM level. And that's an amazingly improvement in the UX, I think. Um, it took me like hours to fi figure out why, um, because I didn't do my EVM lessons. Um, but that's like a very simple example of how you can uh, view how your code interacts with the stack and the memory and find some subtle in interactions. And obviously, this is great for uh, if you're gas golfing, if you're into that uh, and hint support, uh, you can see how different directions will change the opcodes, uh, etc. So the, that was an example. If we go here and we change that to 
shift left. I don't really have, I'm, try, I'm trying to speed run this. Uh, we'll see that our test su should succeed. So we saw mainnet forking, we saw debugging. Uh, now let's talk about cheat codes, which is a great feature of Forge. Basically, it allows us to interact with the VM in a ways that it should, we shouldn't do. So, for example, we can change the block timestamp, we can change stuff so we can do more complex testing. Uh, for example, you're creating a government module, so you want to test that your time delay is configured as appropri appropriately. So you do something, then you change the block number or the block timestamp, and you test that uh, the delay is off or, or whatever. That's a simple. Uh, example. More complex examples that is that you, for example, we can sign uh, using some private key. Uh, we can uh, we can generate addresses, and that's actually very powerful. Uh, that's a very powerful primitive. So we should go back to the code and see how that works. Um, this is from yeah. Okay, so this is from some tests I was implementing the other day, and I need to, nope. That's, all right, uh, right, yeah. So this is from some testing I was implementing the other day. So, you want to test some interaction with actors, with accounts, right? Uh, Sorry? You're right, sorry. Yeah. So, you want to interact, uh, to test some interaction with actors. Uh, in the old days, you would create a user contract that would be basically a wrapper around the contract you want to test, and you would call functions. Uh, but there was too much boilerplate. Uh, we, don't that, want that, uh, we don't want that. That's JavaScript job to have boilerplate. So. Uh, basically, what we do is here is that we generate some addresses using some numbers as private keys, whatever, and then we use uh, a, a cheat code called prank. So here, for example, so for example, here if I do vm dot prank and I add an address updater, the next call will be from that address. So I don't have to re-implement and create a lot of users. I just uh, have my base contract, my test contract. I just generate the addresses. And whenever I want to test some interaction, I just, I just do that. Or if I want to test a lot of interactions, I can do vm.startprank updater. And then I do all my interactions, and then I do vm stop prank. So that's kind of opinionated approach that we use in order to actively and very efficiently rem remove boilerplate and make things faster. Uh, or some smaller UX improvements are, for example, using labels. So you can uh, label arbitrary addresses. So in the, in the stack trace, it's not some random address that you have to remember by heart, but it's actually a name that makes sense. Uh, for example, um, here, nomad-based test. Um, what else is, I'm trying to like give you the like, biggest array of examples. Um, yeah, sure, we have function to set an address, the address balance. Uh, we have a lot of functions that expect a revert or expect some uh, event to be emitted. That's very uh, powerful paradigm. So you can test actually very uh, elegantly for re reverse. Um, yeah and expect call uh, and all that, like new paradigms of expecting what should happen. We talked about the debugger, and now let's do a final thing. If I have the time, I should have the time. I, I, I do have the time. So let's see how we do hard hat to foundry um, migration, because like in Nomad, uh, or test to this hard hat, so as soon as I joined, I was like, yeah, let's do foundry. Um, so let's uh, let's see. Everything is so big. Um, 
here should be okay. Yeah. So we go here like we don't know anything about the product, right? We just join the team. Uh, we open the first test. Common dot test dot ts seems like a good start. Um, it says that it describes nomad base. I know that's a smart contract, so base m m probably that's a test for that smart contract. Like I don't speak hard hat. Um, then okay, we see here that it, it sets some actors. They seems like actors, so that's probably a good idea for uh, base test. So uh, the base feature, as we said, let's create some addresses. That seems like a good idea. Create some actors. Maybe they will be you know, helpful in the future. Um, we, we define them here, and then we, uh, in the setup function of the fixture, we create labels because uh, I don't want to remember that. Then, okay, here it says before um, it does stuff. Uh, I look into that, I see it's basically boilerplate to set up the actors and be able to call the contract. So we don't need that. Great. We continue. It creates a common factory. Okay, so basically instead of having to, to create a factory for your base contract, you just do this. So you just create the contract in solidity. Like, I don't need to, you know, it's, it's built in. Great. So we continue. And here we go to our first test. It says it accepts updater signatures. So again, that's okay. We have two strings, two batch 32, and yeah, okay. So this is a function. Uh, this is a helper function that generates some output, and then we have to verify that uh, the same output will be generated from the smart contract, right? Okay, let's do this. So we go to our base contract. We think maybe that's a good idea to create that helper function in the base picture, so we can use it in other tests. We don't know. Maybe it's not. Maybe we'll move it around. Uh, but for now, we we just go to the TypeScript. We go to these functions, and we see that basically uh, we translate it into this, uh, which, as I said, is just gets an old root, uh, a batch 32, a batch 32. It creates a message and a bytes array, and then it signs that. What's great is that if we go here, uh, if we go to the lib, and we go to core, yeah. So it has a lot of boilerplate. Like in order to do this, you have to write a lot of code, uh, you know, learn the ethers interface and whatnot. But here is simple. You're, we are in solidity. We are vibing. We are moisturized in our lane. Um, like we just, you know, use built-in to hash it, right? We code it with um, the Ethereum signed message string. We, we use the VM dot sign to create to do something that it's not possible to do in the smart contract. That is, sign it using um, a private key that we generated before. We encode it and then we test it. And the test is very simple. So since we have all these functions here, we just go to our nomad base test. Uh, we create the nomad base smart contract. We initialize it. Uh, super simple. And then we just say, OK, this, this, boom. That's the test. So instead of writing 200, 300 lines of code or JavaScript code, we just use Solidity. And because everything is in the same language, we don't have to create in complex interfaces. And of course, again, for some things that you can do in Solidity, we have the cheat code. So for example, here, I want this to be called by updater for some reason. Uh, so I, I use prank. I want it to get signed by the updater, so I use sign. And then I do a simple assertion. So uh, I think that's a very good example of how we turn multiple lines of boilerplate code that you just need to set up your thing to just do the thing. Um, I think I'll stop here, m mostly because I, know, ah, I actually have more things. <laughs> uh, but you know, let's let's chat for a bit. Do you have any questions? Sure. Thank you. I would like. I would love to uh, do all my testing on Solidity, <laughs> but sometimes uh, you need uh, you de your testing depends on a call 
uh, from another external address. Now, is that what you're doing with the sign here? Because I didn't get that. Um, so with sign, basically, you give a private key, and it signs uh, arbitrary data without our, and creates a signature for that data using the private key. So you, you're able to simulate that you're getting a call, an external call from an external address? Uh, that's prank. That you do that with prank? Yeah, so basically with pranks, it says that the next call, it should be done from that address. Okay. Or to be more specific, the message.sender should be that address. Okay. Um, yeah, um, but also like you, because you said external, that's a good uh, opportunity to talk about, we have a cold thing, uh, FFI, it's a flag, and basically it allows uh, Foundry to call arbitrary uh, programs uh, from, the, uh, from Shell. So for example, we can see, actually that's a good, I think I have it, yeah. So this is from LibVM, he's a known Anon. And for example, here he used uh, this FFI to take bytecode uh, to basically uh, compile your bytecode and test it in Foundry. And because we can't do that in Solidity, the, it runs a script, as you can see here. Uh, actually, maybe now you can see. So using this cheat code, right, it can run arbitrary scripts outside of Foundry, and then read the output of that script. So you can do more complex interactions there. Of course, it's a huge security. Don't do that to <laughs> contracts that you don't know. Don't run arbitrary scripts. Uh, that's why it's disabled by default. But yeah, and to give you some alpha, we are thinking to create um, a JSON and CSV um, serializer. So you can read and write easily to JSON and CSV files. Foundry. Um, uh, hello. Um, so yeah. I'm currently, for example, I'm using uh, ETH Brownie, and yeah. I, for some reason, quite like PyTest and the fact, for example, I can use WebSockets um, to interact with other stuff while testing. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, is there a way to integrate this into an existing ETH Brownie project, or would I have to basically just copy over the Solidity and create a new project and then use this framework for the Solidity tests? Using FFI, it will be dirt, because mm. FFI is always dirt. Uh, so it is possible, okay. because it's arbitrary. Uh, it's not native. Yes. Yeah. So that's, we're, we are slowly working with contributions and actually before I finish my talk, I would like to call, you know, to call you for action. Uh, but we are slowly working to support other, like Viper, ULP. Um, yeah, we want it to be a universal theorem. That'd be really cool. Testing actually. framework, yeah. Yeah, hello. Uh, I have no idea where here? you come from. Yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, <laughs> a voice. I really like the idea of testing in Solidity, but the thing is, in many projects I've seen, you've got a few Solidity developers, sometimes just one, sometimes an external contractor, and then you've got front-end devs that have no idea how the blockchain works. Yeah. And this testing is not just for testing the contract, it's also an example of how to use a contract, and it's basically used as documentation. Don't yeah. you think that this, while it's great, would increase the distance between the Solidity devs and the front end? <laughs> Hot take. Um, that might not be a bad idea. <laughs> like, uh, we like to treat Solidity as backend code. Like, would you ask your Go developer to write front end? Probably not. Like, we, tr we like Solidity to think out of it as you know, back end, so it doesn't care about the front end. So we see them as two uh, separate piece of software that should be handled and get mastered by separate people. Um, and that's why, for example, uh, some people um, you know, uh, in the community think that, for example, we shouldn't check for address now because that's a moot. Like, you shouldn't do that. Uh, the smart contract will allow you because we don't want to increase the gas cost for a user problem because that should be cut in the front end, right? So there is this whole 
uh, line of thought of people that uh, want to, to um, decouple them, them too. So people can master their own thing and we can have more secure code that way. Because it's impossible to do good, like both things. Um, uh, when you t showed the, the gas report, you made a distinction that this is not the actual gas, but what Foundry thinks. Yeah. The, can you explain that a little more? Yeah, so it has two uh, cheat codes. Um, let me see. Uh, yeah, so basically, what? <laughs> yeah, anyway. Um, so let's see here, okay? So this is the function of the smart contract. It's not the test, right? So it runs the test. So it it tries to cut, uh, basically it hooks on the call trace of the EVM and it tries to get a good estimation of how much gas um, it, it, uh, it consumes the function without the testing apparatus and all that. Um, I think it's very close to this, the true, but it's maybe it's a bit uh, uh, inaccurate, but, but very small. That's why we say it thinks. Um, it, although it offers some very good insights, for example, average, median, and max, right? That's very good insights, uh, especially when you do fuzzing, we haven't talked about. Um, but the gas snapshot shows exactly how much gas the test function used. So when you're gas golfing, that's a very good thing to do with gas snapshot because you can easily see that in the git diff. Because if the underlying function changes the gas, it will the test will change as well. Um, yeah. Hello. Hey, here. Uh, I have a question about test organization. Um, yeah. So in in hard hat with Mocha, you can do something which I personally find very useful is to use the describe block to master a test and effectively separate context. So um, you have a contract, you have multiple possible branches in your function, you say, when this context happens, then I run these tests. And you can have yeah. nested before each, which call, call other before each and so on. So you can create like a tree out of your tests, right? The question to you is, does Founder have this? And if, if not, is it possible to ever ha have this in Founder given that's in solidity? you can't really define contracts within contracts. Yeah, um, Foundry is inherently limited by solidity in some respect. So whatever organization of your code you can do in contracts, so with your organism in contract and you inherit, um, you can do. So the most modular thing you can do is that you can create a chain of, of inheritance for your fixtures, and you can hook the different test contracts on different levels. So you want fixture one and two for this contract, so you say inherit from fixture two. If you want your other test contract, uh, not the actual contract, but the test contract, which is an organizational logic block for your tests, want to use fixtures one, two, three, four, you say you inherit from fixture four, so it inherits everything. Um, it's Quick follow-up, um, if I have a setup function in a child contract, will that automatically call the parent setup function? Uh, no, that's why uh, here we, um, we in, uh, explicitly call super.setup. Okay. Yeah, okay. quick question here. Over here. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'm wondering what the um, plan is for deployments, or if there is a plan uh, for that. Um, you know, a lot of the other tools um, yeah. have like deployment manage oh, migration managers, and yeah, I'm just curious if there's anything yeah. on the roadmap. Yeah, thank you. That's a so great question that people would think I put you to ask me. Um, so right now the story is uh, it's not great. Like we can deploy single contract per time, and it's like yeah, it's you know, it's like that. So can you see that? So you, de you define RPC URL, you deploy smart contract, it's not great. Um, we are working on a deployment pipeline using Solidity. So the idea is that you have your deployment script, which is a con uh, function in the contract, and at some point you say broadcast. And whatever comes afterwards, 
It's an actual transaction on the chain. And then you say, stop broadcast. And then you do something, and you just start broadcasting again. So we are working towards a solidity-only future in everything, um, which will be lit, uh, but it, we're not quite there yet. Yeah. OK. Can yeah, do you want to do the, your uh, call to action? Yes, thank you. So, um, do, do, do. Yeah. so my call to action is very simple. Um, so in Cell Foundry, it's, it takes you one minute. You have no excuse. Uh, like it's easy. Read the book. It will take you more than that, but it's super well written. Uh, you know, well maintained. We have two Telegram groups for support and for development. You should join. Uh, please open GitHub issues if you find a bug. Uh, if you have a future request, a UX improvement, open GitHub issues. Uh, good reproduction is always advisable <laughs> because we are all open source contributors and. We invite you to contribute. That's super important. Like, if you're a beginner, I was, I'm still am, um, contribute to Cast. It's a very simple CLI tool to, to interact with Ethereum. Um, it's very easy to reason about from a Rust perspective. There's huge UX things you can do there to be able to interact with the chain like that. If you're more uh, advanced, please contribute to Forge. We have a huge amount of features we want to implement. Uh, Auto-generated documentation, auto-generated formatting, uh, forged node which is coming, which is like a competitor of hard hat node, competitor alternative. Oops. Uh, um, yeah, contribute. That's super important. We have a lot of people that are mentoring. I was mentored uh, because I didn't know shit in Rust, so uh, it's a great way to learn Rust and also makes something super important for the ecosystem. So it's a win-win for everybody, I think. Um, thank you. Thank you.